Mr. Gangly Walks the Halls by Tim Sprague. Dearest Margaret, I hope that this letter finds you well. I've missed you greatly during the entire time away from you. But these past weeks have been especially difficult. While we were busy pushing from Normandy, it was easier to keep my mind occupied on other things. Now that the Germans have left France, however, I've had a lot more time to myself. And as always, my thoughts have turned to you. I have good news and bad news, depending on how you look at things. As you're an optimist by nature, a very half-full kind of woman, I'll give you the positive spin first. You and I are going to be reunited sooner than we thought. I'll be shipping off to the good old US of A within a few weeks. No matter how optimistic you are, however, you are also a realist. So here's the bad news. The reason that I'll be coming home to you early is because I've been injured. Now there is no need to worry as I'm going to be fine. Once the bullets stopped flying in France, my unit had been assigned to deliver cargo to the Evian de Lisbonne. You've always have been more of a scholar than I am, so you may be familiar with the town. I had never heard of it before. There have only been three large crates, so Mark Johnson and I volunteered to make the delivery. I've written to you about him before. He's the soldier in my platoon that has a wife and a young son in Kansas. All of my fellow soldiers are brothers, but he's one of the few I can honestly say is a friend. The round trip between Paris and Evian les Bons would take a few days, and we figured that the fresh mountain air would do us some good. We never spoke about it, but I think we were feeling that we needed to get out of Paris, if only for a little while. When you see pictures of Paris in books, it looks like a grand place. You can practically feel the magic in the air through the page. It conjures up images of long walks along the Sion River, and maybe even ascending to the top of the Eiffel Tower to look out at the lights of the city. You and I even talked about visiting someday after we're married. I think that's how the city once was, and maybe it'll be like that again, in the here and now, and though the magic is gone, the Germans did all they could to stomp out the spirits of the people that lived there. They never fully could, but you can tell that the occupation left its mark in more ways than just those damn red and black banners hanging from the buildings. The enchantment and wonder of the city is gone now, replaced with an iron resolve and righteous fury. The longer I stayed there, the more that I could feel the violation Paris had suffered through, if that makes any sense. Is it any wonder, then, that Johnson and I jumped at the opportunity to run a shipment through the countryside? It was supposed to be a simple delivery. As everyone in the world knows, though, there's nothing simple about this war. I don't remember the moment that the truck's rear struck the mine. It must have been left over from the German retreat. Or maybe it had been planted by the French resistance when the Germans were using that particular road. Whatever the case, the explosion flipped the truck completely over and sent us off-road. I only know this because it was told to me later. I remember sitting in the passenger seat while Johnson drove, idly flipping through a Captain Marvel comic book that I had traded a small bottle of half-drunk whiskey to a private for. I'm not much for comic books, but there was something about it that made me feel like, I don't know, made me feel like I was holding a piece of home in my hands, I guess. After that, my memory is slowly waking up. I was laying on something soft, and my body felt oddly cold. Instinctively, I tried to sit up. But the worst pain I had ever felt was tore through my body like electricity. It felt like someone was forcefully pushing down on me while trying to set me ablaze. I shook my head in an effort to clear it. I hadn't even opened my eyes yet, and I was already feeling dizzy. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and a woman's voice politely, but firmly, told me to sit down. As I managed to get my eyes open and squinted against the bright light, she went on to explain that I had been in a mine explosion and to assure me that I was going to be okay. My vision returned to normal after a few minutes, and I was able to look up at the speaker. She was dressed in a white uniform of a nurse, with red curls peeking out from under the hat and freckles dotting her nose. She smiled down at me kindly and told me that her name was Ruth. I tried sitting up again, but it was the same result as before. Ruth informed me that I had suffered a fractured sternum when my chest was impacted with the front portion of the transport truck. It sounded serious, but she told me I just needed rest and it would heal naturally. Normally ice would have been put on my chest to help prevent the swelling and lessen the pain, but there wasn't any access to ice, however, so she was using rags soaked in cool water instead. Along with the fractured sternum, I had suffered a painful bump on the head and sprained ankle. I had managed to escape in surprisingly good condition, all things considered. Johnson, however, hadn't been so lucky. 
He was laying in the bed next to me, unconscious, and his body was wrapped in bandages. Every so often I could hear a gasp as he sucked in air. The gas sounded wet, like they were filled with water. The nurse told me that they hoped he would recover soon, but I could tell from the tone of her voice that she wasn't hopeful. Over the next few hours, Ruth sat and talked with me. Well, she did most of the talking. Even getting a few words out made my chest hurt, so I mostly just sat there and listened. She told me that we were in an old chateau, known by the local people as Chateau des Espirites. It had been the home of a wealthy, eccentric landowner who had died at the beginning of the war. He hadn't had many children or family, so the mansion was converted with a temporary hospital. Most of the doctors and nurses were French, but Ruth was a volunteer with the Red Cross that had been sent to assist due to the place being woefully understaffed. She eventually left my side to tend to the other patients. As I stared up at the ceiling, a stray thought entered my head, and despite my condition, I found myself smiling. It was a crooked sort of smile. Can you imagine, Margaret? Here I was, relaxing in a fancy chateau in the French Alps, and I couldn't even get out of bed to enjoy a moment of it. I had to admit that I tried not to look to Johnson. Every time I glanced in his direction, I felt an awful stab of guilt. I had survived the explosion and would be on back on my feet soon. Meanwhile, he was fighting for his life. It wasn't even fair. Even though I kept my eyes off of him, I could still hear him wheezing and drawing in those wet breaths. Evening came, and Ruth returned to help me to eat my dinner. It wasn't much of a meal, just broths and small bits of potato, but I was so hungry that it felt like a banquet. When I had finished, she changed the rags with freshly soaked ones and put the used ones in a small bucket. Have you ever experienced that kind of moment where it feels like the very air in the room has changed, Margaret? That was what I experienced once Ruth finished her task. Her entire demeanor went from warm and friendly to something much more serious. The smile was gone from her face, and her eyes were uncertain. What wasn't uncertain was her firm instructions that even if I found myself able to get up, I must not leave the room. During the night, I pressed her as to why, but she simply shook her head and turned to leave. Ignoring the pain, I grabbed my wrist and asked once more. She hesitated before gently removing my hand from my weak grip. Monsieur Gondley marche dans les couloirs. She said quietly in French before leaving the room and firmly closing two large doors behind her. Mr. Gangley walks the halls. I stared after her for a while to say that I was confused would be an understatement. I was fairly sure that I had understood her correctly, but as you are well aware, I never had much of a head for languages. It wasn't hard to convince myself that my poor French simply wasn't up to the task of understanding her statement. With that in mind, I quickly drifted off to sleep. My hand had started shaking so badly that I needed to take a few seconds to steady it. You and I have known each other since we were small children. We started school together. You know me better than anyone else, and I'm afraid of what you're going to think of me when I tell you what came next. You're going to think I've lost my mind. I don't see how anyone could think otherwise. I swear to you, Margaret, I am not mad, and what I'm about to tell you is the honest to God truth. I need you to believe me, no one else ever will, but you're the one person that has to. Please. I don't know what time it was when I woke up. The room was dark and still. I knew immediately that something was wrong. I had the same feeling in my stomach that I had gotten on the hills throughout battles in the war. Sometimes the guns would go silent and an eerie silence would fall over everything. Instead of being happy for the reprieve, you start to feel sick to your stomach because you know that something even worse than what you went through is about to happen. That was the same feeling I was having as I laid in the darkness. Something was about to happen. I was so sure of it that I ignored the pain and forced myself up onto my elbows in an attempt to look around. I couldn't stay in this position for more than a few seconds before I collapsed back down onto the bed. Less than a heartbeat after I had done so, I heard a soft click as the room's doors began to swing open. I craned my neck as best as I could and turned my eyes towards the sound. There was just enough light coming in through the windows for me to see the figure enter the room but not enough that I was able to make out many details. It was well over eight feet tall and it had to duck under the top of the doorway to the room. It was wearing a black flowing robe that covered most of its features. As it came forward, it stayed hunched over. It moved with an odd gait, swaying slightly back and forth as it walked. Even though it was the largest creature I had ever seen, it barely made any noise as it moved across the wood floor towards the bed like it had very white little weight to it. I knew immediately that this giant wasn't human. I know how that sounds, Margaret. This is why I'm afraid you're going to think that I've been driven mad by the war. If you do indeed love me as you say you do, though, 
I need you to take what I'm saying at face value and put aside your skepticism until you finish my story. Because of that creature's size, it only took a few steps for it to make forward and reach the foot of Johnson's bed. It was starting to lean over him when I closed my eyes as tightly as I could. As I write this, I can feel the shame of rising in me. This thing was going to do God knows what to a man that was closer to me than my own family. And there I was, keeping my eyes clenched shut like a frightened child, trying to hide from a shadow on his bedroom wall. What kind of friend, what kind of, what kind of man does that make me? I laid as still as I could for what seemed like hours, but all I heard was silence. Curiosity started to win over me. I went over the fear, so I slowly opened my eyes. The creature was still looming over Johnson, but it was completely motionless. Its arms were extended towards his face. The robe sleeves were pulled back enough that I could see its limbs. In the dim moonlight, they looked almost white. So white, it was like a single drop of blood had never run through their veins. They were so extremely thin. No, that's not the right word for it. They looked emaciated. Its hands were attached to its arms at a slightly odd angle. I had seen something similar before when a private had dislocated his hand from his wrist in a bad fall. Its fingers were long, its fingers were bony, and they reached out towards Johnson's face. The hood of the robe was up over its head, and at an angle I was seeing this creature from, its face was completely blocked off from view. It was hard to tell in the dark, but I got the impression that the head was too large for the body. The width wasn't proportionate with the arms and legs. Everything about the creature was wrong, and I felt a sense of revulsion as I watched it. Johnson coughed once. The creature pulled back slightly, but when he didn't make another sound, it drew closer once again. It reached out with one finger and touched him lightly on the forehead. He made a soft choking noise, but remained unconscious. The finger moved down his face, tracing down the nose, across the lips, and over the chin. It stopped when the tip was touching Johnson's neck. The man's entire body had stiffened as if the creature was sending a live current through him. I wanted to yell out to him, to warn him about what was happening, but my mouth remained closed. I was already trying to justify my lack of action to myself. There was no point in letting this creature know that I was watching when Johnson was too injured to hear me anyway. That was what I told myself, over and over again. The truth is, I was paralyzed by fear, and the moment that my friend needed me most, I proved myself to be a coward. The creature's hand opened and wrapped its fingers around Johnson's neck. He whimpered quietly. The whimpering soon turned into gagging as the fingers closed tightly. I tried to will myself to somehow intervene. Fear and a fractured sternum be damned. Instead, I just laid there watching. The figure held up one finger on its other hand and placed its point between Johnston's clavicles. It lingered there for a moment before pushing down harder. The finger sank in and through the skin. He started to thrash, but the creature simply held him by the throat as if it was no effort at all. The finger slowly started to make its way down his chest, skin, muscle, and bone all parted as if it was being cut with the sharpest of surgeon instruments. When it reached the top of his stomach area, it withdrew. Blood covered it, and droplets dripped down onto the man's body. What came next has played over and over in my head ever since. The creature reached into the hole in Johnson's chest and pulled the opening wider. The snapping of bone filled the air as if the ribs were being easily separated. The arm jerked slightly to one side and a moment later the hand rose out of the open chest, holding a misshapen lump. Johnson stopped thrashing. I must have made a sound because the creature turned its head towards me. The hood still covered its face, but I knew that it was watching me closely. Instead of closing my eyes, however, I looked right back at it. It wasn't some act of bravery or defiance, I was just too scared to think of anything else to do. It moved to the side of my bed. The gory mass it had taken from Johnson's chest was still clutched in its right hand. I couldn't see what the object was. I was, and I still am, thankful for that. The creature regarded me for a long moment before reaching up with its free hand to slowly pull back the hood. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. I was stricken voiceless by fear. 
It was all that I could do to simply keep breathing. Instead of being rounded, its head was elongated, with malformed protrusions sticking out of its back. It was hairless, and its its arms, the flesh, was pale to the point of being nearly translucent. It looked at me with lidless eyes, and pupils locked on me so intently that they appeared to be vibrating. The creature's face was vaguely human. The best way that I could describe it was it looked like a person who, whose skin had been pulled back so tightly that it had begun to tear off the skull. The large teeth and gums were exposed in a hideous grin, one so large that it ran past the mouth towards the back of its elongated head to show the bone beyond. It tilted its head slightly. I wasn't looking at just some hideous monster. Its eyes stared at me with intelligence. It opens its mouth slightly as if regarded me. Just beyond the first row of human-like oversized teeth was a second row of them. They were similar, but space wider apart. Its thick black tongue sloshed around back and forth in its slick saliva. Good night, Louis, the creature said in a raspy voice, the words coming out as if it was exhaling them rather than speaking them. With that, the creature turned and left the room the same way it had come in, closing the doors behind it. I must have passed out. The next thing I knew, I was regaining consciousness in a room filled with sunlight. I quickly looked over to Johnson's bed. The spot that the bed had once occupied was empty. Ruth came in a few minutes later. I demanded to know what happened to Johnson, and she told me that he had died from his wounds a few hours earlier. I knew she was lying, of course. I had seen the creature tear him open and end his life. I continued to press her, and as I did so, she grew more and more uncomfortable. She repeatedly tried to tell me that I must have dreamed the entire thing. I became more and more agitated, and finally she relented. She leaned in as if she was telling me something that needed to stay between the two of us, even though we were the only ones in the otherwise empty room. Ever so often she would glance over her shoulder at the doors as she spoke. She told me that Johnson's body had been taken down to the makeshift morgue to be disposed of. When I started to object, she shook her head firmly and told me to remain quiet. The official record would say that the body was incinerated due to concerns of possible disease. That way, no one would know about the damage the creature had done to his body. No one but me. She warned me not to let anyone else know that I had seen the creature, when she again referred to him as Mr. Gangley. The few outside the hospital staff that had tried to tell others what they had seen all died under mysterious circumstances. I needed to remain silent for my own safety. At first, I refused, but something in the way she was looking at me made me want to stop. I got the feeling that she wasn't just looking out for my safety, but also her own. I began to understand that her current position at the Chateau wasn't entirely voluntary. Still, trying to wrap my mind around everything that I had seen and that she was telling me. I had questioned her about Mr. Gangley. What was it? How long had it been at the Chateau? Why had it killed Johnson? The questions spilled out of me as if they would never end. Ruth didn't have any solid answers to give me. All of the doctors and the nurses at the hospital seemed to have a different theory. Some said that Mr. Gangley was an experiment that had been conducted by the German scientists during the occupation. Others said it was actually a German scientist itself, one that had done things to himself for unknown reasons and was still conducting experiments on the patients in this new grotesque form. She had been told by one doctor that he believed it was a demon that had been summoned by the German occultists. I molded over. Mr. Gangley had spoken to me in German. Hesitantly, not sure I should really want to know the answer, I asked how it had known my name. Ruth looked surprised and regarded me curiously. As she opened her mouth to speak, the doors opened and a pair of soldiers entered the room. They told me I was being transferred to a hospital in Paris immediately. And that's where I'm writing to you from now, Margaret. I'm sitting at a small table, a small room, in one of the dozens of medical facilities in Paris. It's been dark for a time, but I can still hear the sounds of talking and laughing coming up from the streets from my open window. Medically, I'm doing much better. My fractured sternum is almost fully healed, and I only have a slight discomfort from it when I move around. Mentally, I'm not really sure how I'm doing. I have trouble sleeping at night, and during the day I feel like I'm walking through a dream. Sometimes I think about how I failed Johnson, and feel a mixture of remorse and anger. 
and other times I've realized I haven't thought about him in a while, and for some reason that makes me even more angry. There are times when I debate with myself whether I should write Johnson's wife and tell her what really happened to her husband, but each time I decide not to. Even if I could figure out how to describe Mr. Gangley and what it had done to him, how could her knowing the truth really be any comfort to her? I'm scheduled to ship out for the United States two weeks from Tuesday. As I come to the end of this letter, however, I realize that I can't come back home to you yet. Even if you somehow find a way to forgive my cowardice, I would never, ever be able to. God help me, I have to go back to the Chateau de l'Esperitz, where Mr. Gangley walks the halls. I love you, Margaret, and I'm sorry. Always yours, Corporal Peter Lewis, United States Army, October 14th, 1944.